Hey, welcome back. This is Joel Duff. Um, it, yesterday, Answers in Genesis published, a, I believe this is the fifth in their series of articles about the, the dangers of young earth evolution growing within their own midst. And so they have a series of articles that's sort of warning their readers that uh, watch out. Well, there's evolutionists within the young earth creationist midst, or at least people who use evolutionary language and speak and that's confusing to young earth creationists because they've always heard that X out that word evolution can't use it in any sense. Now, I'm not actually going to talk about that particular article. Uh, I'm going to save it for another time. There's an awful lot to say about it. It's really, uh, it really says a lot about what Answers in Genesis doesn't understand about evolution or doesn't understand as well about those who are within their own midst that use the language of evolution and understand why they use it. Um, but what's made clear, all I want to talk about today is the cover image for that particular article. The image right up there is the image that is on the graces, the front page of the Answers in Genesis website for the last 12 hours. And if you click on that image, you go to the article, Should Young Earth Creationist Accept Evolution? Of course, the answer is no for them, but they're trying to make, they're going to try to say that some young earth creationists say we should accept evolution. Of course, those young earth creationists aren't really saying that, but this is all a way to try to, um, no, I said I wouldn't talk about the article. Let's stop there. Let's go right back up here and let's just say, let's just talk about this image. What does this image convey? I've always found this particular image a little perplexing. This is not the first time I've seen the figures and the, um, I've, I've seen this image in other ways. I'm going to show you another form of it in just a moment. But what you see is you see uh, little images of a wolf, a coyote, African wild dog, a collie, a bulldog, and a poodle. And what's written above it? It's all part of the dog kind, right? So we know that young earth creationists believe that all these different Spe species or different varieties of species are all members of the same kind of organism. So what they mean by that is that they all share a common ancestor, share a common ancestor in the original creation, but more importantly, they, sh they share an arc kind ancestor, meaning they share a pair of canines that were on Noah's Ark just 4,350 years ago. And from that pair of canines came all these different things. Now, you might be excused if you think that quite possibly that's a form of evolution because if you've learned anything about evolution you would call that that's the process that is the result of the process of evolution taking a couple organisms a population of organisms and having them become many many different species through a variety of different processes like natural selection and genetic drift and mutations and and gene flow and so forth right you wrap all those things up together and you say that what you're describing to me is evolution Go read the article and you find out that's actually that's actually not evolution and we shouldn't use that word. All right, but I'm getting close to talking about that article again. Let's go right back to the figure above. All right, so the 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 first thing to notice is okay, all these are the same kind, which means they have a common ancestor. But that's not the big deal here. The thing that makes me scratch my head, the thing I've always been perplexed about, and I would like a specific scientific definition for is what do they mean by loss of information right you see that there's an arrow that goes across there that arrow whoops i got pointed this. the arrow goes across there it's as if okay you can start with a wolf over here and as you go across and you go from a wolf you lose information to get a coyote then you lose a little more information you get a african wild dog and if you lose a little more information you get a collie and if you lose some more information, you get a bulldog. And then if you lose a bunch of information, you're just going to get a poodle. Ken Ham loves to show this illustration. He shows it in lots of different talks, right? I've seen it many, many, many times. And of course, it is a basic illustration of his overall concept that all organisms since their original creation in their perfected form are simply losing bits of information. And as they lose bits of information, they do, the organisms do change, but they're de-evolving, right? They're not evolving because for him, the word evolve means to gain information. You have to gain new characteristics and you have to, to be something 
different that never existed before. Uh, you can't lose information. And so this is all an image to create the perception that, uh, that even within this kind, you have a loss of information. Uh, I don't know why. Wolves have to be the most information-rich organism. Where is the evidence of that? I think it's intuitive to most people that a poodle is a subset of a wolf and therefore has less information. But now I've been using the word information and we haven't even talked about what that means. And that's the head scratcher is talking about, that's the hard thing to talk about is what does information uh, really mean? What does it mean to Ken Ham? To Ken Ham, I, I think it's just a, a superficial concept that just makes sense, but without having a definition. I mean, I don't think that Ken Ham means to imply or Answers in Genesis means to imply. This is really all of Answers in Genesis. They're the ones that create these figures and many, many speakers are using them. What is in their mind when they are put this thing on the board? I know it's a cartoon. I know what's in their mind is really, I'm just sending this one simple message. But have they ever sat and thought about what the message actually communicates to someone who actually might actually know biology at all? I know their audience generally doesn't understand biology all and they don't have a clue what information is, but that's actually all right because they have an intuitive sense of information just being, I've got more stuff, you've got less stuff, all right? <laughs> you know, I've got more characteristics, you have fewer characteristics, and therefore I must have less information than you do. Uh, and that, that's enough to serve the point, the, to get across the message that they want to get across, all right? But then we sit down and think about biologically what they're saying. That's where the amazing mixed messages come in and the contradictions come in uh, within the literature of young earth creationism. Uh, Kenham doesn't really mean that wolves evolved into coyotes and then coyotes evolved into African wild dogs and so forth. Even though he shows lots of other images of linear progressions as if that's what evolutionists thinks happen. And is he implying that evolutionists believe that wolves became coyotes, became African wild dogs, and so forth? No, although the cartoon makes it look that way, and it certainly implants that idea in their mind. But I think we all know, and I think even the general audience has some conception that domesticated dogs are a variety of a wolf, right? They're not a variety of a coyote. They're not a variety of, a, of an African wild dog. Uh, and so African wild dogs, if they have less information, okay, we got to stop. What is this word information? How would you measure how much information an African wild dog has compared to a coyote? How does Answers in Genesis do that? I mean, who came up with this figure and drew these images and thought in their mind, oh yeah, you got a wolf, you got a coyote, and then you have an African wild dog. Wolves have the most information. African wild dogs have less information. And then you got those domesticated dogs. They have even less information. What was in their mind in terms of like, what was this information thing and how did they assess it? Right. I don't think they had much in their mind other than just this vague idea that uh, poodles can't do as much as African wild dogs. And maybe coyotes are somehow because they're more widespread across the earth. Uh, maybe they have more diversity and diversity by that. I mean, like genetic diversity. And so maybe they have more information because that's more genetic variation is more information. That's one possible uh, way of understanding that. But as I read on Creation Ministries International this morning, because they have an article about what is information in a sort, they're answering a question from a reader who asked that very question, what in the world does a creationist mean by information? And then they have a, a, a long discussion of that, which after you're done reading, I guarantee you won't know anything more than you knew before, except that they're going to say that it's not just like, hey, you got a string of code of 100 letters, and if you have 100 different letters, then the code has changed. Which one has more information? Well, they're really going to say the one that has more information is the one that can do more, right? The, the set of sequence that can do more things, all right, is expressed, is made into things, has meaning. That one that has more meaning has more information. So you don't just look at it as, hey, the, one organism has a bigger hard drive than the other. Uh, and I agree. You can't just look at it as like wolves have a, a 2 billion base pair genome and African wild dogs have a 1.9 you know, billion base pair genome. Actually, I don't know that. I could look it up. But let's just say that that was a difference. So 100 million base pairs. They have 100 million base pairs less. Does that mean they have less information? 
If that's the way you want to define it, then they do, but that would be a terrible definition. I'd be like saying my computer has a, uh, a one terabyte hard drive, all right? And you have a hard drive that only has 500 gigabytes. Right? I'd be like, my hard drive is so much bigger than your hard drive, right? I have so much more information than you do, except that my hard drive has only like 100 megabytes of actual programs on it. The rest of it is just space, right, for zeros and ones, but they don't do anything. Whereas your hard drive is absolutely cram packed full of information. <laughs> I just used the word information. <laughs> cram packed full of programs, all right? Of actual bits of stuff that actually can make things and do things, right? I would say that your, com your computer has more capacity or capability than my computer does, right? So that might be another way of looking at it is how many things can you do compared to this other organism? It can do that many things. Right? We all have an intuitive sense of like a bacteria is simpler than a human being. And human beings can do a lot more things. And so in order to do a lot more things, there has to be a lot more uh, of something there that allows you to do that. And maybe that's something there that allows you to do that is genetic code, right? genetic information. And we do have more genetic information. However, there are plants that have quadruple the amino. You know, quintuple and uh, sextuple and octuple and decatuple. I don't know what, I can't think of what. Is more than deca oct yeah okay lots and lots more hard drive space and even lots and lots of more genes than you and i have right they have a lot more of that kind of information but does that make plants more complex than say primates uh, well, then you have to ask what complexity is. See, we've got, we're, we're running into like one term after another, which all needs a two-hour video in order to really explore. So let's scale it back here. And let's go back to our uh, poodle and wolf thing. So for Ken Ham, um, you know, poodles, he makes fun of poodles all the time. You know, he can't stand poodles. Uh, and he thinks they're like, uh, he likes to make fun of them as like um, the end result of de-evolution. Right. You know, everything's falling apart and uh, we've sort of pulled away all the genetic diversity of wolves, which are like the perfect the perfect kind of canine, apparently, uh, in all these different image in all these different graphics. And what we've ended up with at the end is this this like, you know, worthless thing called a poodle. <sighs> Aside from the anthropomorphisms and so forth and, look, and, and thinking about the, the value of these different organisms, um, poodles aren't necessarily that much less complex than wolves. Right. Poodles can do. I'll, I'll say this. Poodles and other domesticated dogs. Sure, they are in a way subsets of the original variation of wolves, but they also have their own variants. Right. There's lots and lots of mutations that are in uh, in in domesticated dogs that give them characteristics that wolves don't have. So in that sense, they are they have new features that wolves don't have in their original variation. So it's not just a loss of information. It may be a selection of a subset of original genetic information, if that's the way you want to define information, is total amount of genetic variants. They have fewer genetic variants, but they also have different genetic variants. So they have new programs, new abilities to do things that domesticated dogs don't. Uh, sorry, wolves don't. Right? They have behaviors that wolves don't have. And they have features like floppy ears. All right. You may not say, oh, I know you're going to say, oh, well, but wait a second, floppy ears. Isn't that just a mutation? Isn't that a genetic change that lost so that the best, uh, sorry, wolves lost the ability to have upright ears. And in some domesticated dogs, they have floppy ears as well. They can't, they can't lift those muscles, can't lift up their ears. Isn't that a loss of information? Because I think that's exactly what Ken Ham is thinking when he talks about this. Right. They've degraded their original abilities. The original abilities are the wolf abilities and then they've degraded them. And these are now the capacities they have now. But that's not the only way to look at that. If you're thinking about the meaning of characters, because that's what I'm reading in these other articles, is it's not just about, oh, A's and T's and C's and G's. It's about like, what do they do and how does that make that organism survive in this environment and so forth? You know, that's that's the totality of the package of information is its all its, its overall capacity uh, floppy ears don't have no purpose right in fact they have a very great function we love them 
if we are we are the selector, we're the environment. In the environment the domesticated dogs live, they live in an environment with human beings. And in that particular environment, um, we love floppy ears. And so from the perspective of domesticated dogs that have floppy ears, they're very successful because what happens? They get to reproduce and they reproduce and pass on their floppy ears. And the floppy ears are not a selectional disadvantage, right? They have a fitness value. Now, you take a dog with those same floppy ears and you throw it out into the woods and say, like, good luck, you know, go survive in this other environment. Sure, those floppy ears might lead to more ear infections and uh, make it a little bit harder to hear. And, right, they could have other disadvantages, right? Organisms, other organisms and ticks and so forth might be able to more easily uh, take up a home in there. Right, so, so floppy ears would probably be a selectional disadvantage in other environments. So, so you say, oh, well, see, it's a, it's a bad characteristic. No, it's a good characteristic because the characteristic makes it successful in the particular environment that they're in. And so from the perspective of that particular piece of code, there is a piece of code, right, that, that contains the information for the inability to raise the ears. You're still making ears, still mistaking that particular muscle, but you've changed something such that you can't make the muscle structure in a way that will be able to hold the ears up. Okay, and you might say, well, that, but that's a mutation, but that's a good mutation. It's a good mutation from the perspective of those dogs, like my dog sleeping right here below me has floppy ears, right? And we like the floppy ears, you know, and the dog is alive and healthy and, um, and human beings are going to try to keep it that way, right? So in that environment, it's a fantastic characteristic and it has meaning. Um, and so to say that that dog has less information than the wolf, just because it has that mutation, I, I don't see it. I see it as different information, right? Information that's good in that particular context. Yeah, so we could go on and on about how dogs are, are uh, you know, different variants that have different uh, capacities in their particular environments. And they're not necessarily, uh, you know, defects of evolution at all. They're, you know, you could view them as a great success story. After all, aren't there more domesticated dogs in the world than there are wolves? Right? So they are more successful than wolves. Uh, more success ought to be some measure of how much of your capacity to live in this world. And if you have a greater capacity to live in the world than another organism does overall, then you'd have to say you're pretty fit uh, for this world. So fitness can actually be an organism that has fewer total genes, right? And so yes, if losing information means you become more fit, then that is something that can happen. And that's, that's an evolutionary process. It's not, all, it's not always about gaining information in order to become more fit. All right. Now, I just used the word information again, and I used it in a, in a particular sense that not, maybe, not, maybe not everyone agreed to. So I said gain or lose information. Um, you know, is that just a change in information? Is that a, just a re-understanding of what that information does? Uh, and I'm, again, I'm using the word information without even, you know, is that genetic information or is that the things that the genes do? Yeah. Right, I, I have difficulty saying exactly what I would mean uh, by that word. So it's not really surprising that, any, that creationists can't too, but they certainly throw the word around a lot like it's a really important thing uh, without understanding certainly a lot of the nuances of it. Okay, let me go, let's go take a look at two figures uh, that also are figures that Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis has shared to show you how this gets a little bit more confusing, uh, but hopefully give you a sense for how Ken Ham is thinking about the direction of evolution. All right, because that in this image up here is also something that's sort of a subliminal message is here's the direction that evolution goes. Uh, and it's the opposite of what you think evolutionists think. I said two other figures. All right. These are images that have shown up in many answers in Genesis, um, uh, many answers in Genesis talks. And so I think this shows better exactly what that, uh, that, that figure that's on the article today uh, illustrates. So here we, have, here we have our, I guess, our wolf-like thing, right? And it's, the top of, it's at the top of these stairs. 
and then what happens is is that you're, there's a there is the the image of going downstairs which is the downstairs it would be like the thought that you're going down and you're losing information as you go and so the wolf is turning into i guess something like a coyote which is turning into something like an african wild dog which eventually turns into like this hound dog which is turning into another kind of of dog which eventually leads to it's a little hard to see here but it leads to a poodle right and that is the the progression that's happening and of course i i hope i think they know that this is uh incorrect even if they even if they believe that uh there's a loss of information overall that's going on in all organisms it's not like a wolf stepped off the ark right and that wolf walked around and had offspring and it gave rise to coyotes and those coyotes had less information because it's it's segregated the 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 genetic variation it had originally into smaller pools and lost some it saw, lost some alleles and then those coyotes were wandering around they give they gave birth to african wild dogs right and then those african wild dogs were wandering around they gave birth to some kind of domesticated dog after all i'm pretty sure that ken ham and others they they totally believe that domesticated dogs are just a offshoot of wolves so it's actually wolves directly to domesticated dogs not it should be right it's wolves gave rise to domesticated dogs and then there are still wolves left and somehow the wolves have maintained their variation in other words they haven't lost as much information i guess um, why haven't they lost information over 4500 years i'm not sure but what i think they think is there was an original canine and it gave rise to a variety of canines and one of those canines gave rise to the common ancestor of wolves that then gave rise to domesticated dogs and wolves but there also are coyotes right that came from a common ancestor so they, they're talking about common ancestry they just don't like to use the word common ancestry because that sounds like evolution which it kind of is uh, but all this time they're suggesting that all these branches incur losses of information okay fair enough we could talk about like is that really what's happening or not but i think that's what the message is here you've got losses of information as time proceeds and what does evolution say evolution says you have to build up things you have to go from single cells to fish to amphibians and so forth you have to constantly be adding new features so that's the only that is the definition of evolution and since natural selection is taking away variation it's the opposite of evolution like most things there are little bits of truth that are actually underlying some of these statements but the overall uh, the overall concept here is deeply flawed right now one of my favorite images right from a ken ham tweet from a few years ago he's showing four pictures right so to the audience he's showing like look at this great dane and yorkshire terrier look how different they are it's obvious these things are really different they have different information in them right they must be very different informationally easy to use the word information here but that's the sense here um and then he shows the wolves and the coyotes and you can see they're pretty much the same thing right ken ham is really good at judging books by their cover he can look at the cover of something and he can tell you right away whether that book is the same as that other book because if the covers are identical they must be the same book that's ex that is exactly what he's doing here that's the extent of the depth of his thinking that's the depth of his biological knowledge if i just look at the appearance the outside appearance of something and it looks the same as that other thing it must be the same organism hmm that's weird because he spent a lot of time and written a lot of books about how we shouldn't judge people by their external appearances you know race is not is is only skin deep he's made a big deal about that about how you take the total package of a, of a person all of their genome and all the things that that make them who they are and we're all super similar to one another and it's only a few um obvious visual cues that make us feel like we're different from one another he should know this but yet he turns around and looks at two domesticated dogs and because they look different to him they're different things right and you have to treat them as being very different now 
I actually, I don't think he thinks domesticated dogs are that different, but I think he's, he's trying to make this point that if you think these domesticated dogs are different, then why do you think wolves and coyotes are different? <laughs> because we know a lot about coyotes and wolves. We know they're different from one another. All right. You're judging these books by their covers. Let's read the tweet. The wolf and the coyote are different species and evolutionists claim this took thousands of years. Okay. Uh, he's already fudging it with his audience. Uh, not thousands of years, um, somewhere between a quarter million and a half million years is sort of the estimate for the for the time you have to go back to find the common ancestor between wolves and coyotes, right? So you'd have to go back that far ago to find a population of organisms, uh, of individuals that represent the ancestral population that then have gradually uh, divided into two more diverse populations that we can become known as wolves and coyotes, All right? So that's a long time. So I'll make it even more dramatic for Cam Ham, right? He could have made it more dramatic. Yet the differences between the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terror are much greater. The differences between the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terror are much greater. He doesn't define differences. But you know what differences he's talking about. The differences from just looking at them by their covers. They have different uh, coat color patterns. They're different sizes, right? And so therefore they are much different because I look at the wolf and the coyote and they're about the same size, similar coat patterns, similar ears. They're the same dogs, right? I mean, they're the same type of organism. They're less different. And, but we call them different species. Evolutionists call them different species. Look how crazy this is. Evolution is bankrupt, right? That's the conclusion. How could evolutionists look at this and conclude that Great Danes and Yorkshire Terriers are more similar to one another than wolves and coyotes? Maybe because they look more than skin deep at things. And they actually try to understand the totality of the organism and the history of its genome. Great Danes and Yorkshire Terriers are 99.99% similar to one another in their genome. And all the numbers of genes they have, they have all the same genes, right? The genes are doing essentially the same thing. And what they have is a couple variant differences where this gene has two different variants for things like developmental characteristics and coat colors, right? Genetically, when we talk about information, they have the same set of genes. They have the same genome. It has all the same genes. And there are a few different variants. But those variants make very important differences in the overall appearance of the organism. But... To all intents and purposes, they are almost clones of one another. Compared to a wolf and a coyote, which have a different size genome, so talking about the hard drive size thing, they have different numbers of genes. Coyotes have genes that wolves don't have. Wolves have genes that coyotes don't have. Not just variants, but actual genes, actual programs. They have program differences. Um, domesticated dogs have all the same programs. They just use them slightly differently. That's very different than having completely different programs. Wolves and coyotes have different programs. They share a large amount of their programming, but they have differences in their programs. And in terms of their genetic similarity, there's millions and millions of differences at the actual A, T, C, and G level. And so many of their proteins are different. If you've ever seen a wolf and a coyote, behaviorally, they're very different from one another. They don't associate with each other. They hunt differently. They have very different behaviors. Their physiology is different. They can handle different environments, right? These are very distinct organisms, and there's a reason why we consider them to be two different species, whereas the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terrier are just variants of a wolf. Um, this is a, a, a absolutely ridiculous tweet and a ridiculous understanding of of uh, divergence and differences between organisms. And to think that you're too using this logic to try to understand information and information loss and trying to define information, good luck if, if you think that you can define evolution, uh, define information if you can't even understand what differences are between different organisms. Okay, we're back to, uh, we're back to this image above me. Uh, but I want to know, what, what did the original author, the original person who th sat down and said, well, I'm going to make this slide for Ken Ham's uh, presentation. What were they thinking? 
when they rode out wolf, coyote, African wild dog. Do you notice that the wolf is the largest? And this doesn't portray it as, as much as some of the other versions of this, but the wolf is much larger. Then you got coyotes, then you have African wild dogs, and then you got uh, collies, and then you have bulldogs, which are smaller, and then you got the, the end result is, you, what do you got? You got, a, uh, you got a poodle, right? And they usually portray a toy poodle. In fact, Ken Ham usually shows a little tiny, tiny poodle, like next to even these other domesticated dogs. And it's like, this is like the final product, right, of de-evolution. And I'm going to start talking in circles here, but I, because I'm just going to keep talking about how crazy this, this, this particular image is. But maybe you can explain to me what the real meaning of this figure is. All right? If it's something beyond just, hey, all created kinds lose information over time. I want to know why some created kinds, some particular members of created kinds haven't lost as much information as others. Why are wolves somehow full of more information than African wild dogs? Because I think if you went and measured African wild dogs, you looked at their genetic variation, and you looked at the totality of what they can do and where they live, uh, I suspect that I would find it difficult to say that an African wild dog is somehow less fit for its environment and has less genetic variation, it has different variation. All right? I don't see it as a, a loss of information from some original canine. I see it as a different version of a canine that has its own unique programs and properties. Uh, for all I know, African wild dogs might have a larger genome and have more capabilities than uh, a, a wolf does. Does Answers in Genesis know that? Have they actually done the research to, to look at and calculate the information in these? Again, I suspect not. I think this is just a simple cartoon thing. It's just meant to like visually represent losses of information. I just find it a little offensive that somehow a loss of information is always associated with a loss of size. Because really, if you, if you transport that overall like image to other things, does that mean that short people, small people have less information than tall people? I mean, that, that is a, an actual perception that human beings have, right? That human beings look down on people that are shorter, thinking that somehow they are inferior. And that inferiority is actually a way of expressing that you have less capacity, less ability. You don't have the height, right? So you don't have the capacity to do certain things. You have less information. Again, all these things are undefined. Like exactly how would I measure that? That you have less information or that you have less capacity to do things, that you're inferior somehow. How would you, how would you measure that exactly? But we know that there's this overall perception in people and there's a bias, right? toward those who are smaller versus ones that are taller. Uh, I don't think that that is a right thing, but it exists. And I think that, that that actual perception is the thing that's kind of underlying when these types of images here. This is a hidden bias that's just coming out without them even realizing it. Oh, larger becomes smaller, therefore smaller has less information. It is implied that the, the poodle is inferior to a wolf. Ah, didn't expect to go that direction and when I began to talk. So I'm going to get myself in trouble saying things that will be offensive. And, you know, I don't really like to be offensive. Um, so maybe I better just stop myself uh, right now. <laughs> All right, I'll be back at some point. We will actually talk through, I think we'll actually walk through this particular paper. And we'll just talk about how ridiculous this article is. Um, the misconceptions abound. It's just, it, it may be one of, I said the last article was one of the worst I'd ever read at Answers in Genesis. And, and all they did was said, like, all right, challenge accepted. We're going to make an even worse one. Here you go. I can't wait for next week because it's going to be really horrible if that's the case. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>